think it's important that we uh, take a neural systems approach to uh, questions regarding uh, Tourette disorder. And um, it's important to think about the brain as a complex uh, system. The way we've approached this uh, in recent years is using uh, this resting state functional connectivity MRI. And the idea is that at rest, there is this spontaneous fluctuation of bold signal. This is five minutes of data on the x-axis from this region in the left parietal lobe. And this looks like noise. It's not an oscillation. It's often referred to as an oscillation. It's really spontaneous fluctuation. But if you look at the homotopic region in the right hemisphere, a very comparable signal, if you overlay the two, you notice that the temporal correlation is quite high. This Pearson's R, shown here in the upper right corner of 0.8, is an indication of a strong functional relatedness between these two regions. And that's, that's the metric that we call functional connectivity. You can do very interesting things with this signal. For example, if we take that same seed I showed you, the same location I showed you before, and treat it as a seed, and ask the question, where else in the brain do we see a high correlation with that resting state signal? In addition to the homotopic region I just showed you, there's a set of other regions here displayed on the lateral surface of the hemispheres. And the aficionados will recognize that I'm showing the lateral aspect of the so-called default mode network, a network that has been uh, implicated in interoception, self-monitoring, et cetera. Um, it's a set of regions that decrease their activity when one goes into task mode, as opposed to other regions which increase their activity when you go into task mode. It, not just the default mode network can be revealed with this sort of seed mapping approach. Here in an image from Mark Rakel's group, we see that in addition to the default mode, uh, executive control systems, dorsal attention, sensory motor, et cetera, can be revealed as well. Now, a more complex way of taking advantage of this signal is something that we've been doing for the last seven or eight years, which is using a more network uh, analytic approach. So, for example, we, uh, our group, including uh, the lab of Steve Peterson, we've characterized in this data set something on the order of 260 regions in the brain based on task activity and uh, data-driven parcellations. And then what we can do is uh, take all of those regions and create a cross-correlation matrix for each individual. And then uh, I'm displaying here the average uh, correlation matrix across a, a set of individuals. And then use network-driven algorithms to sort of parse the, the, the matrix into systems shown in the partitioning of the black boxes there. And then as a consequence, we can take the systems derived and paint them onto the surface of the brain. The color coding indicates which system a given region is in, or display it in a network uh, scheme there. A related approach, not region-based, but voxel-wise, is, is displayed here. This is work by Nico Dosenbach, Jonathan Power, and other colleagues, showing uh, the array of brain systems painted on the cerebral cortex. And the color coding is the functional ascription given to those systems is based on what we know about those regions in task mode. So it's not, an, it's not from an imagination, it's, it's from well-described um, uh, fMRI experiments and PET experiments that show what these regions do. So for example, we have the visual system, the auditory system, but germane to what I want to set up is that we have top-down control systems like this yellow frontal parietal system that's involved in rapid adaptive online control, or the green dorsal attention system for top-down uh, control of visually guided attention. And this singular opercular system here that's involved in uh, sustained maintenance of task. So these are all systems well-defined and evident uh, through this sort of resting state analysis. Now in red here is that default mode network that I pointed out previously. In addition to being able to paint the surface of the cerebral cortex, we can go subcortically and use this systems approach. I won't get into the details, but we can get a functional parcellation of the cerebellum, of the deep uh, nuclear gray, thalamus and basal ganglia, as well as the medial temporal structures. What's the benefit of thinking this way? Well, if you think about the brain as a uh, functional network, 
It follows that complex cognitive and motor functions emerge from interactions between brain regions and are not attributed to one region in and of itself. So localization, concepts of localization are affected by this approach. In terms of developmental neuropsychiatric disorders, we now think about the development of atypical functional network architectures. And then in terms of response to therapy, whether adaptive or maladaptive, functional networks must reorganize into alternative architectures, getting at neuroplasticity and, again, uh, reifying the a point that no single area's function is going to be explanatory. These are the consequence of complex interactions. Now, of course, the basal ganglia is implicated in Tourette. There's lots of evidence from imaging, from postmortem pathological studies, from beautifully done neurophysiological studies. So there's no question that, uh, that the basal ganglia are involved. And um, it has allowed us uh, for years now to have diagrams like this one, this one generated by John Mink, uh, modified from work that uh, Tom Thatch, his mentor, had done, that shows this complex interaction between the cortex, the striatum, the pallidum, the thalamus. And every time I look at this image, and I've been looking at these diagrams for probably 30 years now, I think this could actually be a diagram of a bureaucratic system or the healthcare system that I work with. You'd have to inhibit the inhibitor. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a tough system to work in. The, um, but it has allowed uh, people like uh, Roger Albin and John Mink to come up with hypotheses about how you might get involuntary movements for example, by disinhibiting uh, the striatum, creating an ex excitatory focus. But this is not a specific model. It doesn't tell you the difference between, say, a tick or a chorea or other dyskinesia. So I want to highlight a paper that I think has really embraced the importance of the systems approach, work by Yulia Warb and colleagues, published in Brain this year, looking at using structural connectivity approaches, not functional connectivity, but structural, to the cortical striatal palatothalamic system. The motivation is that little is known about the white matter organization um, of this set of pathways. Fragmented approaches have been published, but this group took on the whole system. There's evidence from fMRI that we should be thinking about delayed or atypical maturation of these systems. There's obviously strong evidence from basic science literatures that uh, pro projection systems develop in mammals with exuberant initial projections and collateralizations that are then pruned. That's actually re referencing my, pre my, my thesis uh, mentor's work, uh, that, kind of, that kind of investigation. So they, they used MRI approaches to structural connectivity, asking whether this notion of atypical pruning and myelinization of axonal systems is germane. They took advantage of a method that had previously been applied to Huntington's disease and basically demonstrated that from a probabilistic tractography standpoint that they could say whether a pathway did or did not intersect with a subcortical structure or with the overlying cortex. They'd studied adults, could get into the motivation for that. They uh, had good um, measures of YGTSS and YBOX and then they excluded for psychopathology and ADHD. And the heart of what they found is shown here in a side-by-side -side comparison of Tourette's versus typicals, showing a greater uh, number of projections between the, cortical, the cortex and the striatum and thalamus in the Tourette population, and shown in red are the location, or in the hot colors, the locations where there's a greater amount of connectivity in the uh, Tourette population, and blue where there's less. And they point out that there's sensory motor cortex and, and uh, and somatosensory cortex, as well as the paracentral lob lobule, making sense that there would be a, a motor, sensory motor system involvement. And then analyze the other, uh, or interpret the other regions separately. And then they go on to, to point out that in the basal ganglia thalamic connections for the Tourette's, there's greater proportion of connections between thalamus and putamen bilaterally, and at least on the left between the putamen and pallidum in Tourette's. Very nicely, they demonstrated uh, a correlation between the extent of structural changes in some brain structures and relating to severity on the YGTSS, and then a dissociable set of regions that are related in severity to the Y box, the latter being orbitofrontal cortex, the former being more somatosensory motor cortex. Now, interestingly, the thalamoputaminal tract is relevant, uh, highly significant for both. 
But I want to return to this image right here and why I set up the systems approach earlier. So to my eye, what those regions that are being highlighted, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, lateral parietal cortex, the lateral orbital frontal and inferior frontal, and then the middle temporal gyrus, looks to me like the default mode network. So I think that in addition to the observations made, what they have demonstrated is a very interesting aggregation of increased cortical, subcortical connectivity in Tourette's that maps on very well to the default mode network. And you can speculate, we can speculate why a network that's involved in interoception and self-monitoring might be relevant uh, in Tourette. In addition, the regions that have greater connectivity in typicals, shown in blue, map on, at least in part, to the mesial surface uh, of these top-down control systems as well, suggesting uh, a typicality of the, of the development of these uh, top-down control systems. So I would say that this paper demonstrates very nicely that there's a difference in connectivity in this anatomical dissoci dissociation uh, for different clinical elements, and it takes a very strong neural systems approach. But I think the findings are also suggestive of a typical connectivity involving the default mode network and top-down control systems. Very interesting. Jessica and Deanna will, uh, in turn, use this a systems level approach to talk about top-down control in children with and without Tourette's. And Deanna will talk about uh, using um, a systems approach to making predictions about group membership. Okay, the intervention. We know that there's been a number of studies in recent years that have demonstrated a behavioral approach to um, treating Tourette's, the CBIT child and adult studies of Piacentini et al. and Willem et al. Um, re revelation, right, from a treatment standpoint. Now we just have to have more people who know how to deliver it. But um, what we haven't really heard a lot about is why or how it works exactly. How does behavioral therapy work? And why does it work in some individuals and not others? The same could be true for pharmacotherapy. So I want to highlight sort of a pilot study published by Decker Spock et al. last year that looks at the changes that occur in the brains of individuals who've undergone CBIT. They took a, a small sample of patients from the adult CBIT study um, that was done at, the Mass, at Mass General. And they, they did a visuospatial priming task, that, uh, the Swerdlow et al. task from, from years ago that has demonstrated changes in uh, differences in the Tourette population of less inhibition, greater facilitation. I won't get into the details of the task. In the Deckersbach paper, they demonstrate, here's one of their figures, a, an, an intriguing result of a dissociation between the effects of CBIT on the response in the left putaminal region uh, during the visuospatial priming task before and after CBIT. Uh, somehow it's the case that, um, that there's a decrease in activity in Tourette's, but there's also this increase during the waiting period for the healthy controls who did not go through CBIT. So it's hard to know what this finding means. They asked the question appropriately to CBIT normalize basal ganglia activation, and I don't think it's possible to know the answer from this small study. The reason I'm highlighting the study is that I think it's really critically important that we embrace understanding the, the neurobiology of the intervention. I, I'm heartened to see that there's several papers to be, uh, posters to be presented at this meeting on the topic. Mark Laval will teach us more about the response to cognitive behavioral therapy shortly. It's also highly relevant that we embrace the importance of making predictions. Again, who responds to what therapy? We continue to use sort of a univariate approach to thinking about problems like that, looking at the modal response of a population. And in order to get past that, we need to start thinking more about individual level of analysis. That's going to be harder work. Power analyses are not well understood of how to do this. But we have to do it in order to make better predictions for the patient that's sitting in the room with you. And Deanna will talk about prediction. OK, immune system. I, I just said a little bit about the Lennington et al. study. And I just want to point out that they did this very nice, detailed transcriptome analysis in, in the brains of adults with Tourette syndrome. They demonstrated over 1,000 genes who had differential expression, the majority of which were upregulated. And then they did a network analytic approach that returned a set of 17 modules, 10 of which 
we're significantly enriched with up or down regulated genes, predominantly down regulated genes. And then the functional description of those modules was based on sort of standard annotations that uh, have, have, are available. And this comment was made earlier, I think, by Jeremiah about thinking about those functional descriptions. Just because somebody has tagged um, a gene product as related to the immune system doesn't mean it doesn't have a role in some neuroimmune interaction that's independent from an immune response to an infection. Um, the annotations are driven not by thinking about development of the nervous system or atypical development, but thinking about function per se. So uh, be wary of the functional description as um, the, the ground truth. But this study pulled out modules that show that the, what they refer to as the magenta module containing uh, immune-related pathways is upregulated, but not correlated in any way to the modules that have uh, the interneuronal um, genes like uh, this, this uh, turquoise module um, or the astrocytic uh, cell adhesion enriched module called light cyan. I'm colorblind, so I really appreciate the, uh, the, the naming of this uh, system. So um, this is a really interesting set of findings. Uh, th there's a huge number of immune system related genes that are upregulated in these nine patients, w adults uh, with Tourette syndrome in the, in the striatum. But there's a decoupling or an independence of mechanism suggested because although they're upregulated, there's no correlation of that module with the modules that are associated with neuronal functioning. So it's an interesting result, but it remains to be seen how that plays out in terms of Tourette syndrome. But I, I use that really to set up Sue's lovely talk. It's, it's gr really great to hear the, the, how this field is moving, and I, I appreciate that there is going to be a greater overlap in the conceptualization of a, an exploding field of autoimmune encephalitis. Um, so I think stay tuned is, is the right uh, response to that. So I've argued uh, in an interrupted fashion, sorry, briefly for the importance of a neural systems approach to understanding the neurobiological underpinnings of Tourette's and tic disorders, that investigating the neurobiology, the intervention is uh, paramount and that the importance of developing approaches for single subject level prediction is really where we need to be going to understand response to intervention. And that integrating the burgeoning literatures on nervous system, immune system interactions is really a, uh, a task in order, ahead of us in order to understand the development of neuropsychiatric disorders. So I want to thank you.